Hi, everybody. Welcome to Andy's Licorice Talk. Tonight, we have a very special guest. It's Michael Lowenstern, bass clarinetist. He has a special website, and I bought this uh, from it, and, and this is going to be celebrating the bass clarinet. So we have, you know, true superstar, two true superstars on the bass clarinet. Please, if you haven't done it, go to YouTube, search both Lorenzo Yasko and uh, Michael Lowenstern. Um, they're, they're two of the to the finest on the planet. I'm very lucky to be surrounded by them. Please don't forget to like Facebook, our Facebook page, Andy's Liquors Check, and please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Lorenzo is a huge fan of airplanes and technology and the bass clarinet, and this is Michael's thing. So Lorenzo is going to be leading most of the interview, certainly at the beginning. So, without further ado, first we would like to introduce Lorenzo Yasko. Good evening. And you. Hi, Andy. Hi. So, yeah, as uh, Andy said tonight, finally is the night that bass clarinet players can get the control over Andy Liquor Talk. I already tried in the poster uh, of this week uh, about Lowenstern, but uh, yeah, it's a night basically tonight we can talk a little bit more about our instrument. Uh, but before doing that, I would like to introduce our incredible uh, guest. He's one of my hero, and uh, I remember when I started uh, playing bass clarinet, uh, I was 17 years old, and uh, Michael was one of the people I, I, I was going to look on uh, on YouTube or any amazing video he was creating. So please uh, welcome Michael Lovenster. Hey, everybody. Hi. Hey, Michael. Thanks for coming, man. Oh, it's good. thanks for inviting me. Good morning. We, good evening. We haven't, we haven't even gotten started, but we have a hello from Melbourne, Germany, Ireland, Florida, uh, UK, um, Hong Kong, and we have a, we have already. So, so I think you know, hang out to your seatbelt. I think we can we can actually close it like this tonight. Yeah. I think we achieved already. No, I'm so joking. You're, you're, you're not coordinated with her. I know, I know. Okay. So if you see my voice, my face not going with the microphone, the audio, don't worry. Uh, we will explain to you later. Uh, it's a magic. So, Michael, uh, one of the first questions we usually ask our guests and Andy does is uh, what have you done during this uh, lockdown? Uh, have you been active? Have you been doing videos? Because what I know, I have seen a few pictures that make me extremely jealous of you landing in JFK. Oh, yeah. And in, and in uh, is it La Guardia as well? Yeah. How do you do that, first of all? Well, uh, so, so this has nothing at all to do with clarinet, which is awesome. Um, the, uh, so I have a little plane. And uh, it's like what I like to call, it's like a Toyota with wings. It's really small. It sees four people. And, uh, you know, there are big airports here in New York, and uh, it costs a lot of money to land there normally. You know, uh, for, for even for my little plane, they, they charge you by the weight. So the big planes are paying thousands and probably $100,000 to land. Um, but for me and my little plane, I have to pay $500 to land and take off. And so... Uh, I don't do that because I don't want to spend the money to do that. But during the during the um, the beginning of the pandemic in April, there were no flights. And so air traffic controllers were going on Facebook and saying, look, GA, general aviation pilots, will you come and land? We don't want to get rusty. I was like, hell yes. C count me in. And so my wife and I uh, flew from our little airport, tiny airport in New Jersey. Literally, the security of our airport is a white picket fence that you can climb over. And uh, we flew to LaGuardia and landed at LaGuardia. And they're like, "What? well, air traffic control is like, well, what do you want to do now? I'm like, I think I'll go to JFK. And so we flew right over to JFK. And then after we landed at JFK, we came back. And at, after we landed and, and took off again, they're like, would you like to go to Newark? And I said, nah, I don't like New Jersey. So, um, so then we went home. That was it. <laughs> we didn't land actually in, New in uh, Newark. We did not land in Newark because um, I didn't care. <laughs> I hate mm -hmm. Newark. I hate yeah, Newark. Because, uh, <laughs> I mean, I was shocked. I was, I was really, it, this is amazing because I know how the traffic is crazy during the normal uh, day. Oh, and yeah. No one. 
No way. How exciting was to land in those places that you usually land with a massive airplane like 777? Oh, well, you know, it was, it's been a, a bucket list item for me forever. I wanted to, ever since I started flying, I wanted to land at those two airports because those are like the biggest airports and uh, super busy. And each of them has their own challenges in terms of like LaGuardia, you're landing over water and then boom, you're on the, on the ground. So that's a little freaky. Like you're literally over water until the very end. Um, so yeah, it was it was really fun, and I may never get to do it again, but I got to do it once, and I have videos to prove it. Amazing, no, amazing. You got all my respect about that uh, because I did as well, but I did with the flight simulator. So uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I guess it's not the same, but but yeah. at least I tried. Okay. Uh, yeah. So and the the second question is, when did you get the PPL? The PPL and have you got uh, that or yeah, well, it's, uh, for those who don't know, it's private. Uh, yes, uh, private, 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 private. private. Uh, I've had it for five years. Okay. 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 Yeah. Wow. And and okay, no, no, no. Six years. Six years. Six okay. Years. And the, you always had this uh, passion because you know since when I'm little, aeroplane actually comes first than uh, music. For <laughs> uh, yeah. I um. I've wanted. I, I love. Um, Planes, trains, and automobiles. I've always liked vehicles. Uh, I have a lot of crazy, weird bicycles. I have an electric car. Uh, I've always, you know, I've, I've never really been interested in boats, but I've always wanted to have an airplane, and I've always wanted to learn how to fly. And a friend of mine, you know, they bought, he, for my birthday, bought me like a, you know, like a, a first flight thing that you can do where the instructor takes you up, and then you can steer for a while, and then they land you. And that was it. I, uh, I asked Catherine, my wife, I'm like, can I do this? She's like, get some life insurance. I got life insurance. Uh, she's like, like the life insurance vest. I let the life insurance vest so that if, and then I called my like guy and he's, and I'm like, can I get a plane license now? And he goes, yeah, you could even start a drug habit if you'd like. And then uh, I, I got my license right after that. So it was, it was a process that took a couple of years of me not dying for my life insurance so that I could learn to fly an airplane in case I die. So, uh, <laughs> so now you're allowed to die, basically. Now I'm allowed to die, and at least she'll get paid. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Okay, so I think uh, we can close the, the aviation. Oh, Just great like, talking to you guys. Awesome. I'm living, I decided, <laughs> one of the reasons I decided to live next to the airport in Hong Kong is because I have the windows I can see every morning landing lots of aeroplanes. Now, now there are not so many, but it's... Uh, just to let you know how crazy I am about flying, and, and one day I, I definitely want to take the PPL because uh, that's that's really. Anytime something. you're in New York, I will take you up the Hudson River. You're allowed to fly up the Hudson River without asking permission at about 900 feet, which is like the 75th floor. Uh, I, I did with the helicopter. I did the tour with the helicopter. But, okay. But I take your invitation. I'll let you actually fly it though. So. Right. Yeah, you know, uh, speaking of the airport, I don't know if you know about this, but they, I don't know what uh, our airport's quite amazing um, here in Hong Kong. Uh, I don't remember how old, maybe 20 odd years old. But before that, we had a very yeah. famous airport called Kai Tak. Anyone, you got to get on YouTube to see it, to believe it. I mean, literally, wow. you would fly in. And you could almost touch people through the window. I mean, it was it was one of the most famous landings ever. And and they have a lot of the pads. Uh, you've got to see to believe it. So if you have a chance after this, go on YouTube, see landing in Kai Tak Airport in Hong Kong. You won't believe it. There's never been an airport like that, I don't think. Wow. I think yeah. I may have seen that. No, I, yeah, I'm sure you've seen it. You've seen it because yeah. there's a big turn on the right before landing. And it's, it was very famous. So I'm sure you, you have seen it. Anyway, now we want, I want to close this uh, aviation uh, parenthesis. And, and again, amazing that you, you, you could do that during the lockdown. And I think that's probably one of the, one of the big things you will remember about the lockdown, I, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'd say. I'd say it's nice to, it, was, it was nice that I, for me to have a plane so that I could leave New York if I wanted to, right? Um, and I, didn't, I, don't, I still don't feel comfortable flying you know, commercial, I haven't flown since then, but I've, but having the plane makes me feel less like I'm stuck. Great, great. And uh, okay, last question about aviation, then we go to the base <laughs> plan. Uh, how many times do you fly a, a month? I mean, uh, depending on your busy. Well, schedule. I mean, somewhere between two and four, uh, the plane needs to run. It's a, it's a 1973 plane. 
So I need to I need to keep the engine happy, and so I have to fly it every couple of weeks. Great, amazing, yeah. fantastic. So let's go to our uh, main uh, thing, the base climber. When did you choose that? Because I guess, as everybody, you come from clarinet. You know, I choose bass clarinet because one day my teacher at the conservatory said, well, there is this gig to do it. I cannot do it because I have another gig. Take my bass clarinet and go. And I never tried the bass clarinet before, but when I took it, basically, it was like I was playing since 10 years. I was really, I love it. It was like mm -hmm. love in the first sight. So, and then I never I never left that, 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 that instrument. How, what, that, what happened to you? So my story is that the bass clarinet chose me, um, but I'll, I'll, the the longer version of the story is that when I uh, in my school when I was growing up in Chicago, Illinois, um, started everybody on an instrument in the fourth grade, and uh, my parents had a clarinet in the house. My mother played clarinet when she was in high school. And my sister played clarinet when she was in high school, same clarinet. And damn it, I was going to play clarinet in fourth grade because they were not going to buy me an instrument that I was just going to quit. Uh, now, this instrument, I don't think, had ever actually been overhauled since the 1950s. And so by the time I got it in the late 1970s, it was not doing really well. And um, it was a brand I'd never heard of before or since called Norwood. Um, it was wood. And because it was wood, it wasn't shiny. And uh, everybody else in the fourth grade had their band instruments that were plastic, so they were shiny. And my instrument was not shiny. And so um, beside the fact that the instrument itself didn't play, in order to make my instrument shiny, I would lube it up with cork grease before rehearsals. Um, and so not only did it not play, I couldn't hold it. So <laughs> eventually, uh, at, at, by around the sixth grade, I had worked myself down to last chair in the band. Um, I like to call myself principal last chair uh, of my band and my band director in the middle of my sixth grade year. So I've been playing for about two and a half years badly. Uh, he's like, maybe you'd like to try the bass clarinet because apparently I was he told me later I was holding the band back. And so he 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 said he figured I would do less damage on bass clarinet. So he gave me. Um, he gave me the school's bass clarinet, which was shiny, uh, and uh, and the rest was history. I was like, oh, oh, so this is how this works. And that summer I went to Interlochen. So like six months later, I went to Interlochen uh, music camp. And then I went every summer since uh, after that, all the way through high school even. I, in fact, I went my, there my senior year of high school, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so that's how I started is in sixth grade. Yeah, I started on B flat clarinet, but I didn't really start until the bass clarinet found me uh, through all of that story of, of sucking on the clarinet so hard. So that's, that's how it happened. Great, great. Yeah, but, but by the way, just to interject, we've got the two of your past teachers, John Ye, who says you were a virtuoso at 10 years old. Oh, and of course, course. And 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 of course and of course Charlie and Ayako. So who are as you know past guests? They're all here watching you and a bunch of other people. Yeah, it's okay. You don't have to play today. No, no, okay. no. <laughs> <laughs> by by the way, doing some research, uh, and I want to connect that. Uh, you basically were one of the first people making video on YouTube, mm. and I, I see you started basically uh, around 10, 11 years ago. And, uh, uh, yeah, around 2009, uh, yeah. I started uh, making videos. In the beginning, like everybody, I was like, oh, here's an opportunity for me to put up videos of my concerts. And a lot of those were, uh, I mean, a lot of my early videos, which have very few views, were me just performing. But I started making videos. I, my plan was originally to make a video website. Like the whole website would, like you'd ask a question and I would answer it as a video. So, I was, you know, I made a bunch of videos that were all like, if you swore, I would say this. And if you asked about ligatures, I would show, say that. And so I took, so I never made the website, but I had like the slap tongue video and a multiphonic video and I had a couple of those things. And so I threw those up and I was like, wow, okay, so this, there's an opportunity for teaching. And so I realized that uh, it was a meet, I, I was meeting at least some kind of a need or at least an interest. And then uh, in about 2011, I had a student and, uh, she would come to my house from Pennsylvania and she would, uh, 
you know, we'd be working on whatever rose etude on the bass clarinet. And then I would ask her, I'd say like, all right, so now I want you to go find a recording of this. Like all of our teachers would say to us, go find a recording of this and listen to it. What she would do instead of what I had intended, which is her to go to Spotify and, and listen to a recording of, you know, Hindemith or whatever the heck it was that we were working on. Um, she would go on YouTube and listen to other high schoolers play it badly. And so I was like, okay, so this is a behavior. Right. OK, so uh, there's a behavior that when you ask somebody, a high schooler to do this, they will go on YouTube and search for it. So what I decided to do was I would I, I began to realize that this was her pattern. So I would as soon as she left, get out my camera and make a video of what we had just talked about. And uh, and so when she would go search for it, she'd find me. And my first videos, which I don't have up anymore because they were very specific, I'd be like, Jamie, you idiot. I told you to go listen to somebody good. And okay, fine, I'll teach you again. And they were like, they were really like one-to-one. -one. Uh, and I started realizing that people were actually watching those and finding value in those. So then I just started to do that as a, as, as a thing. And so my goal was to do one every couple of weeks, take the summers off. And I've been doing that for, this is now my 10th year. Yeah, because I mean, we all know YouTube now. Yeah. Years ago, I mean, seriously, YouTube was uh, just at the beginning. It was a website. You couldn't find all the videos that you find today. No. So that's why I'm asking, and you actually responded, because I'm curious uh, who brought you uh, inside YouTube, and, and you responded that. And I also wanted to ask if you... I, I always seen you as the guy with the vision, so that you actually predicted what was... You know, now everybody is in YouTube now, 2020. Mm -hmm. What are you on now that in 10 years is going to be the YouTube? Oh. <laughs> uh, life support. Um, no. Um, I just joined AARP. How does that make you feel, John and Charlie? I just joined AARP. That's a retirement. Hey, for senior citizens. <laughs> oh. Yeah. Anyway, no. Uh, what do I have? I don't know. I mean, I, here's the one thing that I think um, that I'm working on personally is that uh, what we're realizing is that COVID will be, I'm assuming, taken care of and the world will heal and we'll be, all be out, back out doing stuff. But we've started a new behavior. We've started a new behavior and are reinforcing that behavior here. You can watch music on YouTube or online. You can have performances that are live online. Uh, so, um, so my interest is less about like, how can we create more, less of these patchwork videos that we see, like there's 70, you know, orchestral musicians playing Mahler or whatever it is, uh, that we're seeing because that's boring. And it's also very repetitive. You see the same kind of thing. It's not visually interesting. And part of, you know, part of, um, there are a couple ways you can go. Uh, one way is, uh, using faster and faster internet to be able to actually have synchronous concerts. And I know Charlie is interested in doing that. And he's, he kind of put the bug in me a little bit to, uh, you know, understand how you can reduce the latency of internet uh, so that you can actually. Do you think 5G will help hugely? About no, I don't. I don't think 5G will help. Um, I do think, however, that people will need to not use Wi-Fi. Um, so you need to plug something into your, you know, main line into your, modem. that's, that's not really my primary goal. My primary one is how do you make music visually interesting, uh, and not like music video type things, but how do you make music visually interesting in this era, era where everyone is watching at home? And then once that era is done, how do you continue to make it interesting? So, you know, using video, and then finally, using interactivity. How can I make something that you can, while you're watching it, say you're watching me play something live, can you interact with me, say, with your phone? And, uh, and how can you create interactivity between the people who are watching you? So I'm actually working, at, there's a guy at IRCOM in Paris who has uh, who's developed this very, very cool, um, uh, it's kind of a server client system where you, if I give you an, if I give anybody, everybody, uh, an internet address all, anywhere in the world, as long as they connect to that URL uh, that I give you, they can actually change the music that I'm playing. And it can be as many as 100 or 200 people uh, that can actually have impact on the, the concert, uh, either visuals or audio or something like that. So that's like, how can you create community 
which is why I think we do concerts, right? We do concerts, not because we want to get on the stage and get off the stage and go have a beer. We get on the concert because it's, we're part of a community and we're actually, our responsibility in a concert, in my view, is to form and and foster a community of, um, of people that are listening to you. How can you do that? when I'm here and you're there and we have wires between us, that's what my goal is in trying to figure out how, how we can use this medium to continue to grow it even after COVID is, is history. Very interesting. And do you think, how long is it gonna take to achieve, for example, my, what my dream, I mean, one of my dream is that one day, hopefully very soon, we will be able actually to make like a chamber music sitting one person in uh, Italy, one person in Hong Kong, and one person in America, and be able to do that at the same time with no delay. Now, wh wh when do you think this is going to happen? I think it can happen now. Um, I think that everybody needs to invest in their own personal infrastructure. You know, if you have your normal internet speed, 100 uh, megabits per second, that's not going to do it. You can barely stream videos when you have that. So you need to have a faster internet connection. I just upgraded my internet connection so that uh, you know we can have more throughput. Originally I did it because my daughter was home and we were all like watching videos at the same time and we were all stuttering and we were like, all right, I gotta solve this. But then I realized, okay, well, this is sort of part of the plan so I can write it off. Uh, you know, Having a better camera, uh, having better equipment uh, connected to your computer, all of this stuff is about improving my infrastructure. If everybody did that, then I think we could even do this now because a latency of 20 milliseconds is really not that much. And apparently from what Charlie has told me is that that's, that's actually currently attainable. And so in the next five years, we, you know, typically that the, I forget what the name, the Moore's law is that speeds increase by they double every 18 months. So if you can imagine that we can have 20 milliseconds of latency now in 18 months, we could have 10 milliseconds of latency, and then you could have five milliseconds of latency. And at that point, that latency is the distance. It's like me standing on another side of a concert hall. You know, then you have five milliseconds latency, and it's just like me playing with somebody on the other side of a stage. Then I think we're in business. Fantastic. That's very good. That's very interesting. And uh, talking about uh, because first of all, you, you, your YouTube channel. I don't know if Andy knows has a forty-seven thousand four hundred subs subscriber. I don't know if you knew that. And the total amount of people viewing has been 7 million 700 views. I did not know that. Yeah, sorry, I did the research, okay? Okay, great. So, <laughs> he was a... <laughs> no, I, Apologize. So that's, that's actually, it's quite really remarkable. I mean, you, it's a bass clarinet, you know, it's not a, a violin, it's not... Yeah, uh, I know. <laughs> it's amazing. It's a, I'm telling you that. So what usually you do, what kind of program? We go a little bit on techie now, but I, I'm interested, and I'm sure a lot of people is interested on that. Um, what kind of program you use, for example, to make your own video? Uh, there are amazing videos you have made. And, um, and yeah, so this is the first thing. What kind of software you use? Uh, I use off yeah, the shelf. Software. I use, um, you know, basically a regular camera, which is behind me. Uh, I have, uh, and I use the software, which is, it, it's Final Cut Pro, or you could use Adobe Premiere. It's just, it's off the shelf software. It's nothing special. Great. I'm telling you because I, I kind of knew it, what was your answer, because basically on day to day, everybody more or less use the same kind of uh, software. But I, I, this is important because a lot of people think when they see video like yours, like, I don't know, September, the the famous one, uh, they think, oh my God, it must have someone behind or it must have uh, uh, like a techie group. And actually, I'm sure that video, you made it. A hundred percent. Yeah. It was just me, myself and a camera. Yeah. Another another guy that we asked the same question was the Nicola Baldeiro. That oh, yeah. That's the same. And it's amazing. So basically today with the, our computer, you know, you have to have a good computer and, and kind of strong uh, RAM and, uh, and, and blah, blah, blah. But basically you can do it and it's not that expensive actually. And you can really make incredible videos. So you can make it with an iPhone, you know, um, you can do really good work with equipment that you already have. I mean, that's like one of my mantras, right? Is that you don't need specialized equipment. You can do anything that I do, basically anything that I do, 
with stuff that you already have. Yeah, fantastic. And um, go, go on about that. Um, I like, you know, one of the reasons uh, I like bass clarinet is because um, it's basically you can play any kind of music and style. And, uh, you know, you can play the modern music, uh, electronic music, jazz music. And I have seen you doing a lot of uh, interaction between electronic and bass clarinet. Do you want to talk about that? What what you do and what kind of things? Um, again, what kind of uh, hardware you use for that? And uh, and if you agree with me that bass clarinet is a little bit uh, um, more suitable for this kind of uh, uh, music. Well, this is what I think because um, you know because this is, is kind of sound is more kind of suitable for uh, uh, electronic music. I mean, if you'd ask, well, let's talk about that part of it for a second, about the suitability of an instrument to a particular style of music. If you would ask somebody 50 years ago if bass clarinet was suitable to um, playing a recital, uh, everybody would say no. Maybe it's more than 50 now. Maybe it's 70 years ago. You know, there, you know, the first recital for bass clarinet was in the 50s, right? So if you think about that, what is suitability until someone decides to make it that way? Um, and uh, Michael, who was it? Who was it in the 50s? Yosef Horak. Uh, Yosef Horak. Huh. Um, so I think it was 1955. Uh, at least that was, that's, that's what the, the lore is, is that it was, it was 1955. He played a, the f world's first bass clarinet recital. And then it'd be like, well, no, you know, well, you can't do it in jazz. And then here comes Eric Dolphy. And, you know, and it, so it's, it really takes, it takes a person who doesn't listen to what uh, what is considered suitable to make that suitable. Um, and there are a number of instruments that are still on the way up, I would imagine. Um, and there are a number of, uh, uh, of sort of style breakers that are on the way up right now uh, that are going to do that. So the idea of suitable or not suitable or more suitable or less suitable, uh, I, don't, I don't buy into that philosophy uh, personally. Um, but in terms of the equipment that I use, uh, I, I uh, to answer the question simply, I use uh, a program called Max M A X Max M S P, and I uh, and I port that into uh, so it's a it's a programming language for those who are uninitiated. It's uh, it's it's kind of like the Photoshop of music apps. You open up the screen and there's nothing there, and you know, and it's not coding like your you know if then statements and things like that, which I. I also can do, but I don't have to do that with this. It's objects. So you you pull an object in, and that object allows you to get sound into the into the system. And then this object will allow you to do something to that sound. Uh, and then this object will allow you to control the object that does something to that sound. And then there's an object that gets the sound out. So really, it's it, at a basic, it's like a flow chart of of audio. Um, so I, I use something basically like that. I, I, I recently moved that into Ableton because you can use Ableton Live with Macs in it. So I can sort of hack Ableton. And that's what I've been doing lately. Now, in terms of equipment, you just need an audio interface. So something to get from the sound from your microphone. Well, you need a microphone. Uh, a microphone to an audio interface to the computer, back to the audio interface to your speakers. And that's it. That's all you need. That's your basic routing of uh, and, and, a, and a clarinet or whatever instrument that you play. And that's about it. And a computer. So um, the rest is just uh, decoration, not literally decoration. I mean, obviously, they do they all of the pieces of gear that I have around me here. You know, they all do something. Um, but, uh, you know, you might want to have something like a, you know, a foot pedal uh, or something like that. But generally speaking, that's all you need. And then you can build from there. One thing I'd like to say also, kind of going back to combine those two thoughts of like what's suitable and then what's what's what, what kind of equipment you use, is that you're gonna have people ask you, you, all of us in our careers are gonna have people ask us, can you do X? And, um, and you could say, no, that's not suitable. No, that's not possible. No, that's not feasible. Uh, or, or practical, um, or you can say yes <laughs> and figure it out. And my advice is to say yes and figure it out. There's no reason to say no, because first of all, if you say no, they'll never ask you again. And second of all, if you say yes, you will learn something. 
So, you know, that, that my whole life is, a, is uh, I hope to think, I mean, this may be a little bit idealized, but I hope to think that I say yes more than I say no. Can you put a bass clarinet YouTube channel on? Sure. You know, can you do electronic music with bass clarinet? Sure. And I wasn't the first. And I wasn't the first to put a YouTube bass clarinet channel on, I'm sure. But, uh, but it's about like, yes, and then figure out what works and read the room and see what needs to change and adapt and, and move forward. Fantastic. I, no, I think you have been extremely clear. And um, one question I wanted to ask as well. Um, so uh, going now into uh, the teaching, because I know you are also in teaching bass clarinet. Uh, and uh, I, tell me if it's wrong, the Manhattan of School of Music, right? Uh, that's the main... Uh, uh, yeah, I, I actually just, uh, I just resigned from Manhattan School. Oh, okay. uh, uh, as of like a month ago. Um, and I can talk about why. But yeah, uh, Manhattan, I, I was on the faculty there for the contemporary performance program for about 15 uh, years or so. Okay, so, and uh, I just wanted to ask, because I'm sure many students are curious to know, what your approach to a new students that they want to learn bass clarinet with you? So what kind of, uh, what, what your, are your advice and suggestion? And actually, you can even talk about book, what book you actually suggest them to do. I, because, you know, I, 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 sorry, I, I tell you, usually when, when people start uh, learning bass clarinet with me, I basically say on the way that you said about, you know, just say yes of everything. I just say, look, take any music you want, any music. Don't start with the filters of music. No, I can only do this, this uh, kind of music because it's not, you know, it's too high, it's too low. Just take whatever it is good music, just take it and play and try to play and this is what I actually uh, I, I do. So even you know clarinet method or uh, cello method, basso method. So what's your approach to, to that? Uh, well, if it's a clarinet player that is moving to bass clarinet, I will have them take some clarinet etudes. You know, like let's just say a rose etude. If that's you know if it's a high school or something like that, there's no reason you can't play that on a bass clarinet. You do not need special bass clarinet etudes. Yes, the bass clarinet, or at least most now, go down to low C, and so there are some notes there that don't exist on the B-flat clarinet. We'll handle those later. You know, that'll come. But uh, but my, my view is you should just start on something that you already, maybe your fingers already know, so that you can see what the differences are in terms of the voicing, in terms of the approach, in terms of your air, in terms of the instrument, uh, and, you know, all of, all of the parts of articulation. And uh, and, and just go from there. And I think that comes from uh, maybe just that John Ye uh, did that exact thing for me. I wasn't on a special book. Uh, I wasn't on any sort of uh, bass clarinet plan. I just played the bass clarinet and I had a rose etude book and that's what we did. And so, uh, and I also did it on clarinet uh, as well. Um, but I think that it, starting off, not treating it like it's some kind of sub clarinet, like base, like lower, lower on the totem pole, lower on the difficulty scale, or something like that, uh, is for, is far and foremost. It is, it is every bit as a much a clarinet as a clarinet is. Um, and then the, you know, we can get into the individual parts of this, but I feel like um, what sets apart a bass clarinet player from what I call a bass clarinet owner operator is, uh, you know, is uh, articulation and sound. And uh, and articulation on the bass clarinet is, is is kind of a different experience, I think, than clarinet. It's certainly got more. There's more in your mouth, uh, but there's also more that you need to do to adjust how you approach your air when you're articulating a note. And this is just my view. And then, of course, the sound. Uh, I want to make the clarion register of the bass clarinet sound like uh, you know the lower register of a clarinet. And uh, and I wanted to I wanted to have that kind of flow. And again, uh, I, I hope I hope I embarrass him by saying that every time I pick up the bass clarinet and play, I have John Ye's sound in my head. Um, I, I I have always always uh, and, and and a couple of very specific pieces of music as well. Um, the 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 Walton Facade Mariner Man is the one that I think of most commonly, which he did with uh, Promusica back in the 80s. That recording with bass clarinet and piccolo and snare drum is the like, it's a minute of perfection. 
And I love that so much. So to me, there's like, there's an approach to articulation, there's approach to using air, there's approach to the sound. All of that is just like, okay, that's what I'm shooting for. Uh, so that's, I think the final thing is like, find a sound that you like and, and see what you can do to get there. And that's just the beginning. You know, obviously we could talk about equipment and, you know, and, you know, mouthpieces and stuff like that. But, you know, but basically it's, it's, it's all in here, right? I think we all agree that you could have all the ligatures and, and it's ridiculous how many ligatures I have, you know? Um, so, uh, you know, you have all that you want, doesn't matter. It's all, it's all in here. I love that. Yeah. So I think for now, my part has been uh, done. I think we can uh, leave it to the master. Andy, which, oh, I don't know, it, can, it, should, it should be here. But anyway, yeah, just, <laughs> thank you so much. For yeah, that. Say, great, great, great. I, I, just a little clarification of what you just said. You, when you, um, first of all, rest assured, you did succeed in embarrassing John Ye. So congratulations. <laughs> on that. But, but for, for my own... Um, Charlie, company, you're next. Yeah, <laughs> for a clarification. You, um, I, I wasn't sure if you meant his bass clarinet sound, or as you said, when you were imagining a clarinet sound. No, well, his clarinet sound too, but his, but I, I'm I was talking about his bass clarinet sound. Okay. Um, I mean, really, honestly, uh, in terms of sound, that was the first sound that was really in my ear. You know, I started studying with John when I was thirteen, um, bass clarinet. Um, and there's a whole story about that, which I think is hilarious. I have a lot of a lot of embarrassing stories about me, not about John. Uh, you know, and John was uh, 23 or 24, so he was he was a kid so too. He, he was the bass clarinetist at that time. In no, the, in I, think, I think yeah, he was a bass clarinet for like a minute, and then Lori joined. Uh, no, so John, yeah. clarify. Wait, how long were you bass clarinet? Were you how long were you bass clarinet in the orchestra? Okay, he, he, he's slow get, on the typing. The invitation. <laughs> he, he, he's so you know jo John is the record holder for the longest interview so far out of eighteen. Three, three hours, one minute, and change. Okay, nineteen seventy-seven to nineteen eighty. He was the bass clarinetist. So when did you start oh. studying with him? Oh, so I was I started in eighty-one. So he was already the clarinetist. Okay, okay, yeah. me a couple. Of, uh, great. So um. What, what we love on this show, because we're, we, the way we look at it, you know, we're documenting all this. Maybe in a hundred years, people are going to look back and, uh, you know, wow, th this piece was written, you know, for this play or that. The way people look at Mulfeld or whatever, and I love it when people go into the old people, I, I, older um, master. <laughs> not you, not not these what people. Tell you who is old? Yes. No, no, no. Uh, but anyway, we um. I want you to do a little bit of a tribute, if you'd like to, to Harry Sparnai and what he did for the bass clarinet, because I know he, you were close with them in the a student. If we're going to do a bass clarinet segment, I, I think we need to include him, and, and who better than you? So, so do it. <laughs> well, well, first of all, it is, it, you know, I, it's, it was an honor to have been a student of his. I didn't know who he was until Charlie Knight had told me who he was. Oh. Um, and, uh, and, you know, it's embarrassing enough to say, um, but, you know, I didn't know about Harry until maybe my junior year of college. Um, and that was around the time that Charlie, who himself had had a, uh, um, a Fulbright, uh, I think the very first Fulbright to Soviet Union, uh, ever, he, he was like, oh, yeah, maybe you should get a Fulbright. I said, what's that? And, you know, and he's like, well, you know, would you want to study with them? We started talking about this during a lesson, and I, and uh, is it, my memory doesn't serve me that well, but I remember doing some research and finding a bunch of these pieces that were in the Sibley Music Library, all of whom were dedicated to this guy named Harry Sparnai, who I'd never heard of. And then Sibley Music Library had a couple of Sparnai records, and I listened to them, and they were just whack 1970s, you know, uh, bleep fart music kind of stuff that was way outside of my spectrum of like whatever. Uh, but I figured, okay, he's the guy. And I just saw that he had had hundreds of pieces written for him. Um, and he was really the, the preeminent exponent of the bass clarinet. So I was like, all right, let me send him a letter. And I sent him a letter and he sent me a letter back and uh, we corresponded and I sent him a cassette tape of me and he's like, yeah, you're good. And uh, and so I applied for the Fulbright and I got it. 
And then I went to Holland. And my very first lesson, uh, I decided to play, I think it was Joan Towers' uh, Wings on bass clarinet for him. And he'd never, he, he was not a huge fan of American music. Um, and he may never have been a huge fan of American music. He didn't like my music. Uh, he told me so. Um, but uh, he uh, he had not heard of Joan Towers' piece. Um, and so I played it for him, and he was standing in the, I'll never forget this, he's standing in the corner, the opposite, literally as far away from me as possibly he could. Um, and he lit up a cigarette in my lesson. Uh, and he started smoking. And I'm like, the hell you think you're doing here? And um, and he's just like, I just wanted you to stop. And so uh, <laughs> so he uh, so he put out his cigarette and he's just like, let me tell you what we are going to play together. And so then he put me on this diet of European music. Uh, you know, it was Lee Sang Yun, and then it was you know. Uh, 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 God, I don't remember the second piece, but it was all this stuff from his album, Ladder of Escape, which, by the way, was like, uh, that was another watershed moment for me because there was some electronic music on there. There was multi-bass clarinet tracking music, like his uh, this this piece for nine bass clarinets, six bass clarinets and three contras. All of the stuff that I do, I could trace back to listening to that kind of thing on his, uh, on that record from 1989 and being like, okay, this is just the shit. So um, I uh, so I studied with him. I learned basically a piece a week. All I had to do there was practice. Um, and so you know, and I challenged myself. Like I'm going to learn the Donatoni soft. I, I took two weeks. Uh, I'm going to learn learn Fernie out. Nope, not going to learn Fernie out. Um, never learned that piece. Uh, but I, I I I learned about 25 pieces during the year. Uh, and then at the very end. He kind of what he did, I think if anybody's studied with him, they'll recognize he'll say to you, OK, um, when you go back, I want you to contact these five composers. And he gave me the names of five American composers. Um, and so I so apparently there were American composers that he was interested in. Uh, one of them was Crumb, one of them was Warren, and I don't remember the others. Uh, I think Carter was one. Um, and he's like, go and ask them for pieces, grow the bass clarinet world. The ba he, his whole uh, life was about making sure the bass clarinet would live on beyond him. And, uh, and so it, it was about teaching you how to learn, like all good teachers. It was about teaching you how to collaborate. It was about teaching you how to, um, how to address an audience. Uh, and how to make them feel like they're part of your world and also that you feel like you're part of their world. Uh, he, he was very, very much, and this sounds now like I'm eulogizing, but he was very much sort of like the every man or every woman's musician. He said to me, and I won't, uh, I went, this is the last thing I'll say and then I'll pause. Uh, I went to go hear him play a solo with the Osco Ensemble. And it was at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam and uh, they had a little hall there. And so we, I went to there, to the hall, you know, it's in like the basement and, um, and I'm sitting there and there may be a, two dozen people in the audience. It's like, it's, it's on a weekday at like 6 p.m. And it's bass clarinet music. So I'm surprised there wasn't one, just one person in the audience. But anyway, I'm sitting down and a guy comes sits next to me and he's wearing his postman uniform. So he had just, come like he's got his sack he had just delivered the mail the hat and uh i went to harry afterwards and i and i said did you know that there was this guy with this like you had the postman at your concert how cool is that he goes yeah i would i would much rather have the postman than someone with black turtlenecks and you know new music hats and stuff like that. He's, and then he would say, he's like, we are not some opera singer with big breasts on the stage. We are normal people. We are bot clarinet players. Let's go have a coffee. And then that was always a, let's go have a coffee. And that would be the end of the conversation. <laughs> so that's my Harry tribute. Uh, you know, he's, he, um, there are so many of us who can trace our sort of li influence lineage back to him. And uh, and and I am an honored part of that family. Great. Um, Hats off. It, so, yeah. Great. Was it, it? It was only one year you were there with him. Yeah. 
That's um, I, just to share my own, and, and I, I had contacted you about this um, very early when I came here. What, what year? I can't remember, but we're, we're probably looking at, well, it was uh, probably probably the 15 to 25 years ago. There was a big uh, new music festival here, and they invited the Het Trio, which was him on bass, piccolo, and piano, you know, and I was thinking, well, what kind? Of, I wouldn't mind hearing one piece by that, you know. And 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 I read it at that time in the program. They had something like 157 work commissioned for that combination, and it was a full on concert, six seven major works. And I was I was just hypnotized, and, yeah. you know. I thought, I mean, if you had told me, you know, I'm going to watch a bass clarinet, piccolo, and piano. Um, you know, and for two hours, just with my jaw open, listening to every single note, I would have said you're crazy. And it was, it was, it, you know, it, it was a really, really um, uh, exceptional experience. And it, and it connects with me now during this and in, in, a, in a big picture of uh, this this project because um, one of the things I haven't addressed enough yet, but I, I was hoping to give a little more exposure to composers that I, I mean, musicians have it rough, but I think world premieres are having it even rougher. So I started commissioning um, uh, works just from my living room to premiere. And um, there was a really great local Hong Kong piece on that recital written by Victor Chan. And I thought, wow, this is like really great piece. And I've been meaning to ask him to write something for 25 years. So finally, you know, it's actually on our, our Facebook page, he wrote me a two-minute piece of something, and it and it was terrific. And 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 I sent you his uh, trio, and you you really enjoyed that one as well. I think, from what I remember. Mm -hmm. um, so you know that that was really interesting. And one other thing, I, I I found out about Harry was there was sort of someone in the in the festival who was assigned to show him around or or look after him or whatever it was. And you know they were about to go on stage, and he turns around and says, "Oh, I forgot to tell you." I always have to get paid before I go out on stage, right? And, that, and the guy said, well, well, listen, you know, I mean, there's a little paperwork. We'll take care of it afterwards. He goes, no, we're not going on stage unless we get paid. And, um, you know, and, and, and everyone was like, and, she, you know, I think they held it up for 20 minutes or something. He got his check. He came out and played this fantastic, uh, you know, concert. That is so baller. That is so hip-hop. I love it. I love it. <laughs> I could just imagine. No, 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 no. Like, <laughs> they thought he was kidding at first, and no, I, you know, I, I'll get back on the flight to Amsterdam. So anyway, that I thought that was, um, you know, that, that, was, that was really interesting. Now, I actually have a question on one of your videos um, on reads. Okay, work at reads. My impression is, tell me if I'm wrong. Um, it's it's more for bass clarinet. Okay, when you're actually talking about balancing and where to, you, you diagram where to uh, take off, it look. I get the impression it's more for bass clarinet. Is it true or not? Uh, well, the impression you should have gotten is that I'm full of shit. Um, but <laughs> uh, the, no, but honestly, uh, I don't really have a philosophy on it. To be honest with you, I know people need. Um, sort of like guidelines and, you know, this is what this touching this part does that for your sound and touching this part does and don't ever touch this part and stuff like that. I, I, I recognize that people, at least the audience that I have, needs certainty. They want to know what to do, what not to do and how to do it. Um, the reality of it is obviously for those of us who do this all the time is adjusting reads is is not a science, uh, at least not to me. It's it's a little voodoo and you do something on a read and it works you do the same thing on the next read and it doesn't work and uh and so so i would look at that video as less of a guide for professionals certainly um because uh you know that's for that reason uh and more of a guide for people who just don't know where to start so whether it's for bass no i hadn't intended it just for bass clarinet or or uh um i had intended it for a reed player and you know again if it works it works uh and and if it doesn't uh you know you'll you'll have to learn the voodoo like we all do <laughs> very good i'm glad i didn't ask you this question right I i'm above that oh good thank you <laughs> 
Oh boy. <laughs> <laughs> the standards are slipping on this show. Anyway, um, yeah, so it's so a little a little hint. I mean, you you spray painted your bass clarinet black. You have a name for it. I mean, what's that all about? Uh, neither of that is true. Sorry, uh, I didn't spray paint it black. It was made for me. It was and, okay. It was and, all and the only person that names their bass clarinet is Michael Drapkin. Okay, yeah, <laughs> he wrote that to me just before here. Okay, yeah. <laughs> I'm getting my Michael's good. So you got you. And you requested it to be all black. I did. So the story of that is I've, I've wanted a black bass clarinet. Uh, I had wanted one for about 10 years. And uh, I became a Selmer artist. And uh, I became friendly with Stéphane Gentil. And, uh, and every time I saw him, I'd be like, I want that bass. I want a black bass clarinet. We will get that for you. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm serious. I want, I want a black bass clarinet. Why? Because it'll look cool. That's why. And that's really why. There's no acoustical reason or anything like that. I just wanted a black bass clarinet. I wanted it to be stealth. Uh, and finally, he agreed. And so he, you know, they, they, I said, look, you've got this system for, uh, you know, Kyle Wurst saxophone. I didn't know it was going to be matte black. I thought it was going to maybe be shiny black. Uh, but when he gave me the option, I was like, oh, hell yes, it's going to be matte black. Uh, because then, then it won't, you, you know, the bass clarinet, you won't see the difference between the wood as much and all that stuff. So I had the option. So he, they, they did this black chrome and then they sandblasted the keys and then they sent all of the keys in a bag, uh, to, uh, to Wolfgang Lor Lof in, in Denmark. And he said, he assembled it. And, uh, you know, because the, the chrome is a much harder metal, uh, he needed different kinds of tools to be able to fit it without scratching it. Uh, because it it does scratch, um, and uh, and underneath it is a brass, and it's pretty obvious. So I have a I have a little uh, thing of black nail polish that I sometimes use. Sometimes it's a sharpie, um, but I uh, you know to keep it to keep it looking all black. But it was really just like I wanted it. Um, I wanted them to make it. I wanted, and and I didn't care if they made ever any more of them. But then they decided, oh well, maybe maybe we'll make them because you know I put it on YouTube and people were asking about it. And then they made a black B flat clarinet, uh, which yeah. I also have. <laughs> they sent me one, um, and you know, it does it sound different? Some people think so. I don't really know. I mean, I have a I have a I have both an, a black and a not black, and to me, they're you know they're different because they're different instruments, but not because of the plating. Wow. That's the story. <laughs> I think I something, in related, one. something related to your, when you were playing in the band, in the, when you started at the beginning, that they put you at the end, at the back, and there's all these shiny clarinets and yours was... Oh, you know, that's so funny. I didn't even think of that. I didn't even think of that. Yeah, I, I'm I'm the king of the, the, the not shiny clarinet. <laughs> 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 so... Now, I, I, you know, I don't know that much about your career, but you work at Amazon. You have a you have a day job, right? So, like, for, you talk us through a little, at least a segment of your of your path. At one point, you've been a full time professional musician, I guess, and now and now you've moved to Amazon. Uh, um, you know, I mean, how did that happen? <laughs> um. So that's a that's a great question. Uh, I'll try and be brief because um, it is a long story. But um, you know, I, uh, I I landed in New York, and I started doing gigs, and I started picking up a lot of. Uh, I, I was always a bridesmaid and never a bride. I never won an audition and had a job, um, and so I was always freelancing and. Um, and around, you know, and, and it was never enough to support a family. And I had a, you know, I had a wife and a, and a daughter and you know, my wife works, but I mean, we had a family and I needed to support it. And, and these sort of, um, you know, gigging around didn't, didn't do it. So I always had a second job working in advertising. And let me just pause and say, why advertising? I look at, uh, I look at when I made, when I did concerts at Eastman, one of the reasons I enjoyed doing them so much wasn't because I was playing an opportunity to perform. I loved, I loved making posters. 
Uh, and well, Mark, yeah. you guys have a lot in common. Huh? You know the poster. Did, did I you made... like his poster of your? Yeah, I thought it was pretty bad. I was I was super impressed, by the way, with your Photoshop skills, being able to find the outline of my body against a white background. So kudos to you. I know exactly how you did it, uh, and yeah. you gave me a nice tan in the process. Thank you. Did you have any headache? Because during that process, I think. I said so many bad things about you, but <laughs> <laughs> hey, not my fault. Um, so um, at any rate, you noticed the, the 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 runway, by the way. Yeah, I did. I did. Yeah. Nicely yeah. done. <laughs> um, but anyway, I loved I loved the idea of of look. I mean, you're you're at a school, and there are four, five, ten, twenty recitals going on at any given day, and. You could go see this recital or this recital and this recital. And people were just posting their recital programs and saying, come to my recital. You know, here's blah, 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 blah. And, uh, and they would always put them up in the same location on a bulletin board by uh, what was called Fingal's Cave, which, is, uh, which was where people would go and uh, like get food and stuff like that, where I had to go and get Charlie's tomato soup every week before my lesson. Sorry, I'm not bitter at all. Um, and... Um, and then he would eat the tomato soup, and then he'd be like, Michael, let me try your clarinet. And then it would taste like <laughs> tomato soup. Yeah, and, and that's when he downgraded to Ayako's cooking, right? Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> it's better than warm tomato soup uh, okay. on, your, on your mouthpiece. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll, I'm just going to finish that story. Then once before a lesson, I decided I was going to eat a garlic bagel with onion cream cheese before my lesson. And I did not brush. And then when he had his soup and he tried my mouthpiece, he was like, what have you been eating? And so <laughs> I think that was the last time he took it. Anyway, um, all right, so so recital posters, there we are. Uh, wait, wait, I, I, no, 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 I, hold on, I wanna interrupt because I, this has been on my mind for years, what I'm about to say, and, and I'm gonna cause all kinds of trouble. But, you know, what I, I was, you know, uh, uh, with Charlie, I guess, I guess even before you, and in those days, he'd pick up your mouthpiece and play. And I actually continued I, I, when it was very unfashionable after, after a while to do it. Do you think that there – for me, I actually think there's a huge advantage. I, I would never do that now, of course. But I'm just asking you, but I'm just asking you is, is that – you know, I mean, I thought that was a big deal. And, I, of course, I work I, – I teach with he and Ayako. I see them all the time and everything. And I see him play on his setup. But – I, I mean, I remember so many times he'd pick up a mouth. He goes, on this read, I would put a little more pressure here. On this mouthpiece, you might try this. And it really, everything becomes so clear in myself, too, when I when I used to try. Um, so it's just all of a sudden, why am I even talking about this? It's obvious that the problem is in the in the setup right, right now. I, how do you feel about that? Well, I you know, we all have different setups because we all have different faces you know and and our our physiology is different uh i have a i prefer a, you know more open mouthpiece because it gives me more flexibility to do things softer read open mouthpiece that's my shtick uh whereas somebody might want to have a really really close setup and a very hard read and that works for them it will not work for me no matter how much i try their instrument i'm going to sound like ass and I'm not going to be able to provide a lot of feedback to them unless I'm playing something similar. So, you know, um, but back in the day, you know, uh, nobody knows what mouthpiece that they, first of all, there, were, there weren't as many millions of mouthpiece makers as there are now. Uh, but also, uh, you know, I was a kid and didn't know any better. So, you know, so Charlie would, he was, he would experiment with me. And he would use my mouthpiece to do the experimenting, which was helpful. He would, you know, he would put a patch on, which at that point was a piece of rubber band that he cut off of a broccoli um, and super glued that to my mouthpiece. That mouthpiece still has super glue on it. Um, and, you know, we would try different things like that. But uh, I don't generally play other people's mouthpieces. What I do is I let them play mine. Mm -hmm. And if they can get, if, if they play mine and they feel like that is there's either more free blowing or it's like, I can totally make this work, then we're somewhere. Um, and, and I think playing their mouthpiece is, uh, is certainly, uh, it's a tactic I don't use. I probably ought to, but I don't. Um, but definitely letting them play my mouthpiece. And then I have a ton of mouthpieces at, at the house, all 
there are a bunch of them that are similar, but then I have like one of everything. Mm -hmm. And so they can try literally any mouthpiece. I have tons of reeds, thank you, Van Doren. So they can try any strength of reed, any mouthpiece that I have, and then we can kind of work that way to see, okay, if mine's too open or too close or whatever, we can find something. So that's how I do it now. Uh, you know, you can try mine. Are we in the ballpark? Okay, let's see how we can fix it. But I don't tend to play um, on, I just never did play on other people's mouthpieces. Okay, you can go into uh, advertising. Po posters, oh. yes, posters. Posters, oh, yeah. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. 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 Cut me off and give me the hook if I talk too much. Just be like, we should have a oh, safe word. No, 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 if, you, if I hear grapefruit, then I know that it's time to oh, move on. Okay. Um, so, 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 yeah. Anyway, I would make recital posters, and what was interesting to me was figuring out what the be the behavior of people are. It's like, where do you see a recital poster normally? Then I should put a recital poster somewhere else because if I'm a ma if I'm part of like a mass of recital posters, I'm just one of many. So I was looking for the right media placement, as we call it in the ad business, and I would put them inside elevators, on floors, in bathroom stalls, in front of a urinal. I would find places where people were not doing something else and would have a few seconds to read a recital poster where there was no other recital poster. And, and that to me was fascinating, which is like, okay, well, which recital poster was where and how did it work? And that's all advertising. So understanding your audience, where you can reach them and what message works is 100% advertising. So to me, it's like, well, that's the interesting part. Maybe I should work in advertising too. So I got a job in advertising and I enjoyed the hell out of it. And then just so happened, again, this is one of those say yes moments. Um, there was this, this thing, what is it called? Oh yeah, the internet. And uh, that happened in the mid nineties, right as I was moving to New York and I had an opportunity and they're like, hey, we're starting an internet department, who's in? I raised my hand, I said, yes. What's that? Um, and I mean, I knew what it was, but, uh, and I started working in their nascent at, at gray advertising, the big venerable gray advertising, uh, you know, have a Coke and a smile, gray advertising. Um, they started an internet group and I was one of the first members of it. And so from there on, uh, I've been working in advertising. And then at one point, so going back to why I made the switch was, I was making so much less money in music and working so many more hours, which is not un, you know, not a surprise. But then at the same time, I was doing some of the gigs that um, were the gigs that I had wanted to do when I was, you know, I, I looked at myself from the, I was like, this is what I want to be. Then I will have made it when I'm playing with this group and this group and this group. And I was playing with all of them, uh, you know, and, or most of them. And I'm like, 35 years old and I looked down the uh you know down the row and I uh I don't know if I should say this or not but I let me just say I'll, I'll say it anonymously I saw another bass clarinet player who was in his mid 60s doing the same gig that I was doing in my mid 30s and I was sort of and I transposed myself forward I, I moved you know in time 30 years and I'm like, do I really, really want to be doing the same thing in 30 years? Um, Cause that's where my money, that's where the gigs were. So I, 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 you know, some people decide they want to go into conducting. Some people want to form chamber music groups. I just decided, why don't I just do something else that I like, which is advertising. So I made a decision in 2005 to quit everything. And I, Within two weeks, and I had interviewed for a job, so the job was offered to me. That was what sort of prompted this sort of moment. Uh, I decided to take the job, full-time job, not freelance, like I'd been doing at Gray, and I, I, and I made the switch. And within two weeks, the phone stopped ringing, which was also mm -hmm. something that, that like, I, I realized that my fears were accurate, that yeah. I didn't really matter. I was, I was a bass clarinet player, I wasn't Michael, I was somebody to fit, to fill the chair. And, um, and maybe that sounds a little bit cynical, um, but then I decided like, well, for the music I'm gonna do, I'm gonna be Michael and I'm gonna do the thing that I wanna do and I'm gonna do this advertising thing. And that's how it started and that's how it's continued.
Mm. And, and what, what, what do you do in, in Amazon? So what, what is your day job? like? What My day job right now is uh, I work in their automotive group, believe it or not, and I'm figuring out how to sell cars on Amazon. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's my job. It's it's uh, now there are nine of us in the group, and our goal is to sell cars on Amazon. And Amazon US, U.S. market, right? In the U.S. market, because they sell they sell in foreign markets, but the U.S. market has all these crazy old franchise laws and stronger unions, and all, every state has a different set of laws. And some like if I sold a car in Michigan as Amazon, I personally would go to jail. So you know, there's all sorts of like legal stuff that we're working through. So it's a fascinating job. Um, but in the meantime, there's work to do with, uh, you know, uh, auto manufacturers are, they're struggling to get people into dealerships and all that stuff. So our job is to help, uh, you know, manufacturers sell cars and then ultimately see if we can, uh, find a way to sell them on Amazon or at least some kind of a hybrid model. Pardon the pun. We, we had a, um, uh, uh, one very off the beaten track interview with uh, Lawrence Gilliard Jr. He was a classmate of Monte Juilliard, a, a, a clarinetist, who ended up be becoming like an A list TV star, movie star. He he was a star in The Wire and The Walking Dead and everything. And you know what, what's his name? Larry Gilliard, but I'm not allowed to call him Larry. He goes by Lawrence now. So uh -huh. anyway, I, 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 you you can wiki him, and, and you know, I mean, he he um because there was a composer at Eastman who was also in The Wire. So I wondered about that. Well, and, anyway, um, you know, so so we were catching up after about thirty years of of you know uh, being being in, involved in all this. But he said, you know, Andy, melt me down. I'm still a classical clarinetist. I, I was floored by that. He said, I'm still a classical clarinetist. He quit, quit it all, you know, basically in, um, you know, college age. So I'm just wondering, uh, do, when you think of yourself and your identity, is it one or the other? Is it all of the above? What's your identity? It's a great question. Uh, and so I'm a performer. Um, I play the clarinet. I play the advertising, um, but all of it is a performance. I talk to clients in boardrooms. I put ads on the internet and elsewhere. I play the clarinet on YouTube and in person. It is all, um, it's all about performing. Uh, and it's all about sort of reading the audience, adapting to the audience, improving what my performance is. And uh, and like I said, creating community. Now, advertising that I, you could be very cynical and say that doesn't do that doesn't create community, and you're probably right. But generally speaking, uh, it, it I love the personally the feeling of standing in front of a group of people and uh, and shaking my butt, and you know, uh, and it doesn't matter the forum for that. So to me, if you boiled me down, I'm a, I, I like to perform. Um, even on YouTube. I mean, yeah, I'm teaching, but it's also a performance and, you know, it's edited and it's not, you know, so that I'm able to sort of tweak things, but it's, it's all, it's, it's not just what I say, it's the delivery. And uh, I think that delivery is important to reach the audience that I'm going for. Very, yeah. Um, now I, well, I want to ask you a question. Is it, I think there's other people I have in mind how things complement each other. Um, is it that um, you have this passion, this skill, and it's a good relief from this passion and that skill when, when you do it, you put on a different hat? Or do they actually complement themselves in any way? Is there anything about playing the clarinet that is that helps you in the advertising business? Is Are you kidding? Anything? Absolutely. Absolutely. And vice versa. Uh, and vice versa. So I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, yeah. So succinctly, um, when you're standing on a stage and you have a memory slip or you're playing jazz, you're improvising. Improvising is the ability to think and do at the same time. That's a skill that improvisers get. Musicians in general, we prepare ourselves to do a particular task and then we give ourselves the freedom to either um, you know, make little changes, play a cadenza a certain way, take a repeat, whatever, whatever the case is. So this ability for us to, to, to do two things in our brain at the same time is super, super useful in a boardroom. 
when I'm presenting an idea to the CMO of Hyundai. Um, because, or when I'm in the room literally with Jeff Bezos and I'm having to pitch him an idea, which I had to do once. And that was scarier than any performance that I've ever done before. Um, but the, you know, the, the idea is that somebody's going to throw you a curveball. They're going to ask you a question that you haven't prepared. That's my memory slip. I'm, it's sort of, I'm trying to build an analogy. You have to improvise your way around and back to the path. And that is, I think, a performance skill to maintain composure, be able to think and talk or think and play at the same time. So that's how music informs marketing or business. Where business informs music is that business is very analytics based. A lot of it, at least certainly the business that I'm in at Amazon. We know what products you've bought. We know what books you've read. We know what movies you've watched. Uh, we do not know what you said to Alexa, contrary to popular belief. <laughs> but we have uh, we have we know what you search for. There's a bunch of data points, right? So we're able to sort of build a thesis, a hypothesis about the kinds of things that, first of all, you'd be interested in buying, but also the kinds of messages you would, you would respond to if I was marketing to you. And then we market to you, and then we see how we did. Uh, so there's there's this it's a, it's an experimentation loop if you think about it advertising if it's if it's done properly is you do a performance that's your ad you analyze well you do your homework to figure out what ad to make you do the performance you prepare it you perform it and then you see how you did and then you do it over again so if it, and for me that's helped enormously on YouTube where I'm able to see how far someone's watched in a video what the genders and age breakdowns, uh, what times of day, where they stop watching, how often they restart watching. Um, all of that data is very useful to me to figure out what kind of stuff I should and shouldn't do. How long should my videos be? What's the content? If I say something funny, does that get more views? Do people rewind and watch it again? Should I be funny? Should I be more serious? What parts get dropped off? Um, you know, those are the kinds of analytics that help me iterate on what I make on YouTube. So that is how my business helps me in my, I guess now, performing world. But the other thing is, after a concert, especially music that I write, you know, people will come up and, and talk to me and want to see my gear. And I'll ask them, I'll be like, so what were you expecting? Did you get what you expected? A couple people, usually a, a beer afterwards, when they're more sort of lubricated to tell me truth. Um, to find out like what didn't work. And I have killed pieces one, like, I love this piece. Everybody hates it. Okay, time to retire it or fix it. And and that's how I use, like, I guess you could call that analytics, which, but it's more focus group of, of like what worked and what didn't work in a live environment. And again, that comes from business. So I see those two as being very complimentary and I use them to the advantage that I have. <laughs> Which is a little bit, I mean, in a, in a much smaller case scale of what we do uh, with uh, with, uh, with this show, we we actually go through the analytics and we try to see what we did well, what we did bad, what well actually what ended as bad or well. Uh, <laughs> well so and it's, it's really it's wild or well. Did you notice that one? <laughs> it's really really fascinating actually because it really uh, helps you mm -hmm. to try to improve for the next uh, mm -hmm. show. And, uh, and and it's incredible, I mean, uh, that we can do that today. And that also is, I mean, if we're all going to be moving online for the next however many, we all need to be comfortable understanding um, what the numbers mean. And if we don't, we can, we can, we can have good guesses, but ignoring it is really not an option. Right. And that's not something that we're used to as musicians is sort of reading the audience with that kind of granularity and drawing conclusions. And also some of them are hard conclusions. Mm -hmm. do, do you, um, do you want to share a couple of those, uh, answers to this question you said what 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 have you noticed in your channel with seven point odd million people over 10 years what are the kinds of things that didn't work what are the kinds of things that did work sure um so one thing that, a couple of things that i've noticed are my audience is primarily 13 to 24 years old uh that's my largest audience males uh i'm 86 percent male audience uh, 14% female audience 
or actually I think it's 13% female audience and 1% unknown or other. And, uh, and then my second largest demographic is people over 60. So I'm at the, I'm, I'm, I'm at like learning age and I'm at the relearning age, if you will. And so to me that, that, that uh, my hypothesis and what I continue to build on is that I'm serving an audience who is uh, who, who is still learning. So I'm not, um, and, and you know, what's the chicken and the egg? Is it because I create the content that this happens or is it this is the audience and I've created, so they both kind of feed on each other. But I'm very different than Nicholas uh, um, because I play, but I talk a lot more than I play, mostly. And I talk about, you know, I, I talk about instruments, I talk about new gear, I talk about problems of the, you know, I talk about fixing stuff. It's, it's an educational and not just a performative environment. And so that's, that to me reinforces the fact that, okay, that's my audience. Um, and that's the kind of content that's been working and I should continue to do. It's not easy to always come up with new stuff to talk about. Uh, you know, I'm 200 videos in and 10 years in, and I'm thinking like, how much more is there to say? And uh, and it's a struggle that I have now. It's just sort of like, all right, well, what I want to make, what what am I going to say that's interesting? That's not sort of retreading. <clears throat> uh, what I've learned that doesn't work is uh, is live performance videos. So me standing on a stage playing wow. is not successful. Wow. I, I've left them up because you know there's no reason to take them down. But people are not as interested in seeing me play. Uh, and so I don't put up like concert videos of me. Sorry, sorry. So one question: do, um, do you see after you do this live video, live concert, in the next few, in the next weeks, you see an increasing on view, or actually stays stable, or those videos have uh, poor views? They have poor views, and they remain poor. That's okay. Very, very understandable. Yeah, yeah. Um, the gear videos where I talk about equipment it, are very popular, um, especially mm -hmm. if I'm making. It, you know, see, I'm. I think part of the thing that uh, maybe is unique uh, is that first of all, um, I don't allow anybody who ever writes me and saying I want you to make a review of this. Uh, I have this form that I send them basically, which is like, oh, okay, have you seen my videos? Are you sure that you want me to make a video for you? Number two, if yes, send me your thing. Once you send it to me, there's no going back. I will make a video and you don't get to see it until I post it. You get no editorial ability over this video. I will not take down this video. I will not add to this video. I will not retract. I mean, this is once, and, and so your decision to send me something is your acceptance of these terms. Um, and I do that because I've had people who are just like, well, man, you said my, you said my bass clarinet was a piece of crap. I'm like, you asked me to review it. And <laughs> yeah. so, uh, and I even had, a, a, they even sued me or tried to sue me. Well, uh, I, I, have a, I have a really, um, <laughs> I, I'm fa I have a, I'm fascinated by this question. What are the percentages of people who then don't send you the equipment after you give them the terms? <laughs> because I mean, that's a mind-boggling concept. What you just said, basically, you know, these taste tests are good as long as you can hand pick the, the you know the guy who chooses Pepsi over Coke. But you know, I mean, but I, I'd love to know. I, I look, first of all, what case sampling are we talking about? Are we talking about 10, 200? Um, you know, how many people have asked you to, to send in? Um, uh, I, I have a backlog, so they're not all up yet, but at least 25 or 30. Okay. And how many people have said, we're not going to take that risk? Um, one. Okay. Wow. That's, 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 you see, that's really interesting to me. I would never have guessed that. Very interesting. Yeah. And, uh, and I won't tell you who it is. No, no. But, okay. yeah. yeah. But they told me, they're like, we're too nervous. You're too much yeah. of a, of a wild card for us. Yeah. And I'm like, you got to believe in your product if you want to send it to me. Um, you know, cause I, I, I think part of it, I don't take any money for the reviews. I don't take a commission on the things that I say are good. 
Um, you know, I, I have to, you know, I keep a real consumer reports sort of like untethered to advertising dollars and stuff like that. I, I make it very clear that that when I, when I say something, I'm telling the truth. Generally speaking, there's always something, something good, something bad. I don't, I don't ever pan anything except for once. Uh, and I made an awful lot of fun of, uh, of one product in one of my videos. Um, and they have never sent me anything again. <laughs> um well now now you said that you're you're not like i mean i mean there's no point in in in, in talking about nicholas but you have made performance videos with you know just performance video I'm, I'm not talking about live performances yeah no. like lorenzo but like september or whatever so that is like and, and how are those received for example uh September was received really well. Yeah. Uh, and that was a surprise. And it was also the first time I had done like a multi me video where I was, you know, editing multi versions of me in there. I don't use a green screen. I use something, I, I did something slightly different. It took a lot more editing. I know that uh, Nicholas will use a green screen um, and then, or, or some, no, he's actually done both. He's done both. I've seen both. Uh, and his work is so good and he's such a great player. Um, but then, you know, I did a couple after that that were nowhere near as successful as September. So, uh, and I and I sort of scratched my head and I'm like, well, I actually think they're better arrangements than September, but they they just were not as popular. So I, you know, um, I don't really know what the secret sauce is yet for those. I did a crazy video in January, this is not to answer that particular question, of me reviewing two $90 clarinets, the sort of the, the red plastic and the yellow plastic clarinet from Amazon. That did remarkably well this year. I have really no idea why. Um, so that's the kind of like, I, I scratch my head and I sort of hypothesize and I make videos to sort of test the hypotheses, but yeah. I don't know why that you know people just don't want to hear me play. What kind of ages they had? If if you see the analysis of this. Uh, of oh yeah. This, uh, so yeah. It's, again, it's it's thirteen to twenty four and sixty and up. No, for the clarinet. No, 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 no. For the for the clarinet that you tried, the the the, the toy clarinet, the one that. What about had. it? Oh, who's why? Uh, same. Same. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And September. Same. Uh, that's a little bit more universal. Yeah, but well, now listen, we can't. Um, in fact, they came here, Earth, Wind, and Fire, just two, three years ago. We we actually went to see them, and um, and I noticed on your comments, the composer said, "This is really good." And, and, and you were, I mean, and and she's passed away. I, I said, you know, yeah. we just talk about that. For, I mean, that that to me was mind boggling. I mean, uh, you know, uh, that blew me away. Uh, I was obviously like that made my day. Uh, <laughs> and I had another situation where I did a Steely Dan arrangement of Peg and Donald Fagan reached out. Really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and he's like, I want to, you know, you want to come to a concert I'm playing uh, in New York. That was last September and uh, or October. And he, I got to meet him, you know, I got to go backstage. He never came out. <laughs> I was supposed to go meet him backstage, but I just met his band. Um, but, you know, that's uh, occasionally something like that will happen, which just like, wow. Did anyone ever write in and say, how dare you? That's a terrible arrangement of my piece. Um, no, but I've had a lot of bad comments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, there are a lot of trolls out there. Most oh, of them are we, we've, we've learned that too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that I'm not popular, for example, on the uh, woodwind.org clarinet list. That <laughs> I've been told, and somebody's people have sent me links to some really, really mean comments about the videos that I make on on uh, on that bulletin board. Oh well, wow. it's fine. It's okay. <laughs> Are you um good? Good about publicity is always publicity. That's so, right. That's right. As long, right. as, talking, as long as they're talking, um, so I, I mean, I, I didn't want to get it. I, I didn't realize I was going to get into something like this. But you know, obviously, your videos really are educational and clever, and all this stuff that people are saying. And, and I, I, I am, you're welcome. And and I imagine that you'd be a very good teacher. So I actually, in, in a place like Hong Kong, once the blue moon 
you'd find someone um, a, as I was going to say something nasty, but but I'm outnumbered. You know, who, who's as enlightened as wanting to major in the bass clarinet? So, and and I and I I knew you were at Manhattan School, and and I and I said, I'll I'll tell you what, I'm going to have this guy in the air in front of thousands of people. Let's ask him how can someone study with Michael Lowenstein. So now I'm already a little confused. Um, maybe maybe you can, uh, you know, not 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 in in that. Hey, I live in New York. Can I come over for an hour? But you know, I live in Asia or something. I wouldn't mind going abroad for a year, kind of kind of. Yeah. I, um. So, are you asking me why I left Manhattan School or how to come and teach me? We're good. Let's first start with: it, Are you part of a degree, visa, you know, program today? Okay, nope. all right. Now we can talk about why not. <laughs> um, well, if you want to, of course. No, I do. I do. I think actually it's important. I, I mean, I think that you know, secondary musical education is important. I um, I don't know who's watching. And I want to make sure that I just sort of preface by saying that uh, I had great teachers in great schools. And I think I was lucky to have both at the same time. Um, my feeling about uh, music school. And sorry, sorry to interrupt. So I just want to make sure. I mean, we, we know we know already some excellent teachers. Charles Knightick, Harry Sparnoy, um, John A. Is, is there another one in a, in a school maybe that we don't know about? No, those were my main features. Okay, fine. Yeah. Um, I'm getting a weird echo. I don't know what that is on your side, but um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Just, we just dropped the mic. It probably has something to do with it. So. Okay. Uh, anyway, I'll just I'll just tell you. You know, I, I look at music school as kind of like trade school, if you think about it. Like you, you know, you go to you, you well. You know, you can go get a humanities degree, and it's this sort of well-rounded thing. You go to music school, learn how to play your instrument and focus on this one very specific trade. I could go learn how to be an electrician or a plumber or a clarinet player. That's how I kind of look at it. And and I look at the cost involved in a trade school. I look at the value of the well-rounded education and I and I start I start to wonder if that well-rounded education is something that is preparing students for the world that we currently live in or whether they are preparing students for a world that we wish we were currently living that we currently live in, or we are preparing students for a world that doesn't exist and used to exist. And as I look at more and more universities, um, and I'll include Manhattan School, which is a good school, you know, and it, you know, it's got a good program, it's got good facilities, it's got good faculty. Uh, but I wondered to myself, if somebody wants to come and spend $50,000 a year and that's just to come to school. That's not even living in New York. So let's say $100,000 a year or seventy, eighty thousand dollars $80,000 a year to come study how to play the bass clarinet with me. Um, I had a real sort of ethical problem with that uh, because I was teaching in the master's program, teaching about, you know, it was, it was very concentrated. It wasn't even just, it, it was even a more narrow focus than a typical broad education. And I really struggled with um, with the fact that a, a student was going to spend upwards of $200,000 to spend two years learning the bass clarinet with me. You could live in Asia and travel every other week and study bass clarinet with me for less than $200,000 and stay in a really nice hotel. I thought, you know, I, you know I, I wondered where I wanted to play in that world. I knew that I had an opportunity and I have had an opportunity to teach on YouTube. Now, uh, and uh, and so I use that as my platform. And then if people want to come and ask me specific questions, I answer them for free. Uh, I send them emails. Look, I have a good job, so I'm happy to help. If somebody wants me to spend an hour with them, yeah, I'll give them a lesson on, on Skype or on Zoom or on FaceTime or in person, of course. Um, but generally speaking, I, I, I didn't necessarily feel like I wanted to be part of a matriculated program that wasn't preparing students for a career that currently exists, which would require that they learn how to improvise, that they learn how to play folk music or jazz music or something other than, uh, than you know, traditional classical music, that they learn how to play more than just orchestral music, that they learn how to compose or at least work with composers, that they know how to do electronics or at least know how to record themselves or at least know how to amplify themselves. Those kinds of skills 
are the skills right now that we are all forced to do, right? We all need a camera. We all need a microphone. We all need to be on YouTube. We all need to know how to use Final Cut. How much of this shit do they teach in schools? Now I'm getting on my soapbox. So to me, all of the things that we've been preparing students for did not prepare them for the flexibility they needed to deal with COVID. And so people have been asking like, well, how did you figure this was a good thing to do? I just did it. And it happened to be lucky that I knew how to do it 10 years ago so that when this happened, I can do it. But I feel like this is the kind of thing that, you know, multimedia applications for music education or for music are required in music education and they're not being provided. And so to me, unless a school is willing to provide it and really prepare a student for, for the world, if you will, they need to rethink their curriculum. And so to me, I didn't, uh, I, I asked for that. I was in a program that I thought provided that. And I, uh, and ultimately I made the decision that it wasn't right for me and I didn't feel good about it. Okay. So that's the first time I've told anybody that. Wow. <laughs> well, it's no longer private. <laughs> I, I'm not ashamed of it. I, you know, and I'm not, and I'm, again, I'm not belittling anybody who decides to do a path, whatever path they take. It's that's fine. It was a, that was a very personal decision for me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so, so you've got this full-time day job and, uh, and you're still kicking out all these videos and it's clear that you, you're, you're, you, you're an extremely skilled bass clarinetist and musician with addressing all the aspects and all this. Are you on a, on a physical level? I mean, I'm sure you're you're growing you're growing, but I mean, are you getting better on the bass clarinet? I mean, do, how do you do that? Do, are you actually trying to to play better than you did last year? And how how does one do that between the videos and and the day job and everything else? What do you practice? You know, to, to do that. Really interesting. Um, first of all, I don't practice as much as I ought to, or that I feel like I should. <laughs> yeah, um, I do now that I'm home all the time. You know, that's great. I've got a clarinet sitting next to me, and between a meeting or in a half an hour, I can I can shed. I never obviously could do that at work. So this is proven. I, you know, you you make hay. Uh, when the sun shines, as they say, or you make lemonade out of lemons or whatever the phrase is. So, uh, so I, I found that I'm actually able to practice more. And what I am practicing is actually how to be a simpler player. I feel like I, uh, I, I I've started listening to myself and I've, uh, and I'm wondering, uh, can I increase my flexibility by being less complicated? Uh, in the way I approach music. So I'm focusing and I'm going to be actually making a video or two about how how to play more simply and beautifully because you can listen to somebody like uh, you can listen to somebody like Marcellus and you could say that's really boring. And I used to and sometimes still do think that there's a lot of there, like I'm not you know, there's like, where is the interest? And then I started then I finally got old enough when I realized, oh, wait, it's the simplicity that's beautiful. And so I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to be a, a better player by being more, uh, by approaching something more simply. Good. That's what I'm working on right now. And so to do that, I am literally going back and playing like Jean Jean uh, and, and, and even a rose etude. Uh, where I can just be like, you know, you try to imbue it with so much emotion and you're like, no, just play it simply. Play between the notes, that's what John always used to say. He used to sort of scratch between each of my notes. And he said, those are the spaces that you get to do music. The notes are the places where those are your points of entry. The spaces between is, so I was I was coloring in the spaces way, way, way too much. And now I want to see if I can just do something more simple. Good. Now, now along those lines, I mean, you, you have this really big project in, the, in, in this website. And you mentioned before um, uh, you, you mentioned before that you take off summers to, to do. I, I, I only caught a little bit. Oh, I don't. I don't make videos in the summer. I take a break. Oh, you take off from videos in the summer. I right. thought you, you took off from your job to make videos in the oh, summer. Oh no, 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 no. Uh, <laughs> I, yeah, no. Wow. And um, is it? 
I mean, how many how many videos all together do you have? Did you say a couple hundred? A couple hundred. Is it hard to keep on coming up with subjects to uh, you know? Yeah, that? it is. Uh, and I mentioned that a little bit earlier. It, it is yeah. difficult because there's only so much you can say about something, and I don't want to teach a particular piece of music. Uh, I find that that's actually, unless it's an excerpt, that's not successful uh, in terms of what people want to see from me. And so, you know, it's the people want to understand more concepts and basic concepts uh, about articulation or about phrasing or about how to play high on the bass planet or slap tongue or that sort of thing. And um, and so there are only so many concepts <laughs> that that you can go over. You can use a piece of music to illustrate a certain concept, but there are just so many concepts right to me. And so it's about figuring out, all right, well, what's a nuance? that I haven't thought about. So that I think is partly what's where, going back to your earlier question, I'm learning by digging into like, what have I not talked about? And then realizing that I haven't talked about it because it's not something that I think about. So maybe I should think about it. And that's what drove me to like learning how to play more simply, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I actually look at the videos as a way to push me to examine my own playing more uh, and then uh, use that examination as an opportunity to talk to other people about the same thing. Okay. Now, how, how do you reconcile that, you know, the sound and everything is in your head and we have this whole Zen uh, speech, but at the same time you say, but I've got every mouth, look at all these ligatures in front of me. I've got all these mouthpieces. How, where, how do these worlds come together from the guy who just said, none of that matters. I use shoelaces for ligatures or whatever. Um, because like I said, it all happens in your head. I have the mouthpieces less for me. I play one mouthpiece. Uh, they're not for me. They're for students. Um, and, um, and also I have them because if I'm working with somebody now online and they're like, I'm playing on a, you know, an M13, I need an M13 here so that I can sort of get a sense of what that is. Um, so it, it, I found I've had them for a lot longer, but it just so happened that they got more useful. Uh, now that I'm teaching online where I can't necessarily play their setup, going back to an earlier, earlier question, uh, and they can't play mine. So I have to do sort of double duty, which is just like, okay, if I was you and I played this mouthpiece and I played my mouthpiece, okay, I, I, that, that's why I have them. Uh, in terms of sound, though, I think we would all agree that you're going to sound basically like you no matter what you play. Mm. Good. Now, you're talking about new learned behavior during this period and how that's going to affect things. Do you think um, Do you think other things are going to be damaged by this? In other words, maybe the concept of live concerts, maybe people are, get, are getting used to this kind of thing and kind of like the idea, like you said, just, just being able to practice between a meeting, like working at home, just being home and being willing to chill and, and watch it. Do you think that live music might be more in jeopardy or live lessons even? Um, if this thing ever gets sorted out anyway. I look at it less as a worry and more as an opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, this is an opportunity for us to, this is all one big worldwide experiment, um, whether it be theater or music or visual art or uh, what have you. And what is a concert? What is a live concert? Um, what is a musical experience at a concert? And, you know, if if we're going to be doing stuff like this, what makes it interesting? Because it's not the it's not the personal uh, contact that you have, or at least you're breathing the same air as the performer. There's not that sort of feeling of spontaneity necessarily. Um, and so what do, what do we do to keep it interesting? What do we do to keep us interested? And so to me, I, 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 is it in jeopardy? I think it's only in jeopardy if you're inflexible. Mm -hmm. Uh, I think that if you if you use it as an opportunity to experiment, and I think um, you know, I think I, I got this sense of experimentation from all of the people that I studied with, uh, present company especially, uh, that that experimenting um, with your medium, with your instrument, with the music is is the only way to stay relevant. And that I think is what's separating people from the I'm really worried from the I see this as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. I'm actually wondering, as someone who's made CDs and this sort of thing, nowadays, even I, I mean, I'm the biggest techie dummy, the biggest fear, you know, person of everybody. Um, 
But even during this period, I've gone from like an iPhone and talking to, to something more complex. And the more that I see Lorenzo, for example, growing and obviously someone like you uh, talking, I'm just wondering, I mean, even it's like everyone's becoming a producer. You know, every every everyone's becoming an engineer. I'm wondering if these specialist guys are, are actually going to have their hands full trying to keep their own, um, uh, you know, their own relevance as literally musicians are now becoming um you know they've got all the software the software is becoming easier cheaper the mics are pretty darn good already they're affordable everyone's learning the skill we're, we're, we're locked on I'm, I'm wondering if that whole area is going to be more in jeopardy are you sir you're thinking about like recording engineers yeah yeah i mean you can, uh, let me just turn this around and say, do you think that um, because people are home and cooking for themselves that restaurants will become irrelevant? Uh, that people will not want to go out and have an expert do something for them, even though they know how to do it themselves? Um, I'd argue not. I would argue that there's room for everybody. I think I would also argue that being more educated about the thing will allow you to make better choices. It will allow you to be a better consumer um, of both food and recording engineering. So I, I look at this again, it's like, this is all positive. Will it put some industries in jeopardy? Yes. Um, I think, I don't know, obviously I don't have a crystal ball um, or else I'd be on Mars right now. But uh, I, I think that, you know, there's a, there, there's an opportunity for us here to, uh, to become better producers, but that will also allow us to be better um, collaborators when it when it comes time for us to actually be working with other people. Right. Again. So why, why don't we, so as a teacher, we're, we're, we're going to start my usual closing down as a teacher. <laughs> what do you, um, what do you know, or what, or as a player, what do you notice as general tendencies worldwide in players nowadays that you would gravitate as a teacher, things that you wish they did differently or common problems, to be blunt about it. Common problems with, okay. Um, I think that there's a culture of, of, well, I think we all wanna get better faster. I think everybody wants it, like instant gratification. We certainly get that dopamine rush when we are seeing how many views we have on YouTube, for example, and all of that that we recognize as being, you know, part of having a device in our hand or at least around us all the time. Uh, I, I, I see a lot of people that I meet, uh, maybe a lot is a, is a strong word, but I see people, I see a tendency for people wanting to find a shortcut much like we would find a cheat for our video games, you know, where we can be like, all right, well, I can beat the boss if I hear left, right, left, right, up, down, up, down. Okay, great. Now I'm on to the next level. It doesn't work that way on clarinet. Um, and so there is no, there is no fast lane uh, for a skill that we are all dedicating our lives to. And so I see, I, I, I see, and I think a lot of teachers may see, and this may or may not be different from the past, people wanting to find a way to not put in as much work and get further. Uh, and, and I say that, you know, uh, everybody I meet, like new music is not the, the quick way to success. Uh, or, uh, you know, I'm gonna play bass clarinet now because I'm a sax player and so therefore I'm gonna be more marketable. There is, it's, you know, you gotta put in the time now on two instruments. So I think that's the biggest thing that worries me is that people want something that's faster and easier. And as a result, our standards are going down uh, as teachers. And I don't mean that universally, but I, you know, I, I do recognize, I'm sure that the level of the top players is still the top, right? I mean, there's just, you know, there are great players out there. They're going to be, there's going to be the next Martin Frost. Um, and so, you know, that's great. But I think that the bench is probably decreasing in quality a little bit. And that's my fear, is that we're accepting that. And finally, why don't you give some general advice to, you know, young people uh, and try to get into music. And, um, and if you want to, it'd be nice if you could actually uh, sneak some COVID in there, the, the, what the, the challenges they're facing now and, and how to deal with those. Sure. Um. Here's my general advice, doesn't matter what age you are. There's a time in your life 
This is to all of the students. There's a time in, in your life where it's time to work on getting better. That's your whole focus is improving and fixing things and learning how to fix other things and improving the and, and making yourself a better musician and figuring out how to solve problems. I can't tongue between 116 and 120. That's a problem. Okay, I got to solve that problem, whatever the case is. Um, and then, and this is an important part, and then you are out of school and it's a hard transition to move from always thinking about getting better and fixing to performing and being the musician that you are at the time. And I see a lot of students and a lot of young musicians who come out still wanting to fix all of the things that they had been working on. There's a certain, you know, that's, that's a habit that you get into is I want to fix, I want to fix, I want to fix. And, uh, and at a certain point, you have to recognize, I need to focus on the things that I'm good at. And I need to, and then everything else will come along. OK, so for me, it was like, I'm going to focus on the bass clarinet. There is stuff that I can't do on the clarinet that I still can't do on the clarinet that has vexed me since I was 16 years old. I could be focusing on that or I could be focusing on the things that I do well. Focusing on the things that you do well is what makes you unique. Um, focusing on the things that you don't do well is what makes you like everybody else. <laughs> so, it, you know, so I think that the best advice I can give is forgive yourself the things that you can't do. Focus on the things that you can do. Believe it or not, the things that you can't do are going to come along. You don't have to necessarily focus on them. They will still come along. I can now tongue between 116 and 120, and I didn't have to spend a year of my life working on crepes or whatever. So, so, my, so forgive yourself. Focus on what you're good at. Uh, and you will live a much happier life than if you focus on all of your faults. So that's my, my advice to you, in ge to people in general. And I had to learn that as much as anybody uh, has, you know, ha has that to be told to them. Anyway, uh, and then in terms of COVID, this is, this is your opportunity to learn. Now, before I say this, I want to say there was an expectation that we all put on ourselves, which is that, cool, I don't have to commute anymore. I'm going to spend those two hours practicing my clarinet or doing this other thing and having these expectations. And there's actually this, there was a great article in the times about this, or maybe it was the Atlantic, which is about like, we, we had this uh, surplus of creative energy. All right. Well, these are all the things that I wanted to do and I never had time to do, but now COVID is going to allow me to do. And we went ahead and we, we used up that surplus energy. And so by April, we were all just like, don't feel like doing anything. That's okay. Um, and don't put too many uh, unrealistic expectations on yourself. I, I think we all went through this, uh, you know, uh, tell me if you guys did, but it was like, all right, now I'm going to start this podcast or I'm going to make tens of tens of thousands of videos, or I'm going to make a see. Yeah. And then, and then you have this expectation. This is what you have to continue to do. Forgive yourself. <laughs> <laughs> we, we just had this conversation about an hour before. <laughs> Very good, Michael. Very good. Um, so you've been bringing up Charlie Nightick um, a lot today, and and one thing he was our second interviewee, as as you know, and um, and and other people, of course, have, have done this, but I think it's just just great. He just said, Andy, when I asked him this question, people, especially established people, it's on us to be proactive. And I've really been preaching this thing, and we've tried our best, and I know you, you've been doing it. And um, and his quote, he gives his talks on, on Friday, which is, I guess, one of the ways he's being proactive. I thought this is a great quote for musicians, and we'll end with this. So be involved in music. Stimulate, it's stimulating for the mind compared to so many things out there at the time, and it's beneficial to humanity. So... Um, Michael, thank you so much. Charlie, thank you so much. Everybody uh, for tuning in as usual. Lorenzo, thank you too much. Thank you. uh, you're a little too good. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the reason we had some microphone problems tonight, I mean, is because we are basically sharing the same room. He's right next to us. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so but it's been great. Look, I actually like to be in the dark side because then I can try to solve all, all his problems because you usually make all these mistakes. Yeah, right? him and about and, 10 other shrinks I've been seeing, but you know, good luck with that. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway. Everybody, thank you so much, Michael. Michael, thanks for a fantastic interview. That was really inspiring. 
educational. It, shout out to the past heroes. It's everything we're looking for in, in this program. So thank you so much. You're awesome. the new poster boy. You're the new poster boy. Awesome. Well, <laughs> I'm happy to be a boy still. All right. Uh, well, it was a pleasure to see you guys. And uh, yeah, um, thank you, Charlie and John, for everything. Um, I, I say that to you as often as I can, but I I never can say it enough. So thanks. And thanks, Andy. Thanks, we'll see you next week, everybody. Okay. Yeah. Bye.